Welcome everybody to the first uh, school board budget workshop for FY20. Um, for each workshop, um, I'm going to hand over uh, the, the leadership to Elizabeth, our finance chair. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. So good evening and welcome to the first of five planned budget workshops. The budget review schedule is available here tonight in hard copy as well as on the school district website. Just click on the budget link at the top of the homepage. It's easier than ever to find budget information. All budget workshops are open to the public, recorded and posted online with public comment welcomed. The school board will open and close each meeting with the opportunity for public comment. Um, that differs a little bit from our business meeting, so I'm just going to say that again. We're going to welcome um, comment from the public at the beginning and at the end. There's a sign-in sheet at the back. Table. Excellent, and it would be wonderful. People would sign in so that um, we know who's speaking, and if you have follow-up comments, that we can talk with each other. Please give your name and address before you begin speaking, and please limit yourself to three minutes. Questions and comments may be received by myself or Susanna via email. Please go to the town or school department website, navigate to the school board section, and click on an email link to send your thoughts to us. I wanted to share the school board's goals for the 2019-2020 budget with everybody, and we're going to just keep reiterating these throughout the process. Number one, maintaining and improving the high quality of education for every student. Number two, careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Number three, clear and continual communication throughout the budget process. The excellence of our schools is a boon to our community and a point of pride in Cape Elizabeth, a badge of honor for our faculty and staff, and a priority for our administration and school board. Every item in our budget, therefore, must at least maintain or preferably improve the quality of education for all students. Following that priority, each line item must be scrutinized to understand how and why it is contributing to student success in concert with its impact to the budget. Finally, in order for all stakeholders to understand and be a part of this school board budget process, thus giving it the robust review and input it deserves, the superintendent and school board must communicate clearly and often throughout the process. We will hold these goals in mind as we examine each cost center, each department, each school, and each program. When decisions need to be made, we will weigh them against these goals. Tonight, we will hear from each of our administrators and directors with an overview of his or her department or school. This is a chance for all of us to get a big picture view of all the pieces of our school department and how the parts work together to provide an excellent educational experience for our students. In order that we have time to hear from all departments and get a global view tonight, I encourage board members to make note of comments and questions and then email them to Susanna or myself so that the appropriate person may provide a thorough answer at a subsequent workshop. <clears throat> Before our first presentation, I'd like to open the floor to any members of the public that wish to speak. Okay, seeing none. I now turn this evening over to our esteemed administrators and department heads for their presentations. Superintendent Donna Wolfram will make the introductions. Do you want to just announce we'll take a break somewhere in between yeah. departments? We have just decided we would like to take a break about halfway through because we do have a long evening ahead of us. So when we get to the end of a department, um, perhaps around 6.30 or so, we'll take a brief intermission, stretch our legs, and then dive back in. Okay. Thank you. So tonight we will hear about the pro proposed expenditure budgets. We have not yet started working on the revenue side of the budget and we just heard today that we should receive our subsidy report by February 15th. This really puts us two, week, uh, yeah, two weeks behind um, in our revenue budget um, as we originally expected to receive it on February 1st. So, um, so now we have to wait till February 15th. And that's new news to the board tonight. We were just notified today. 
This evening, our district administrators will present the, their original request budgets for FY20. They were asked to submit budgets that reflect what they feel they need to maintain and improve the high quality of education for the students in their programs. I have met with each administrator and um, Catherine Mesmer, our finance director, to discuss the number of staff in their budgets, asking what is your enrollment, how many students do you have in each class, are there any courses or classes that should be dropped, added, or changed? And if you had a new added a new position, is there or if you yes a new position, is there any way we can um, change around the present staff to um, accommodate those needs without adding new staff? Uh, we've also requested uh, discuss requested supply and equipment items along with any uh, faculty uh, facility and maintenance needs that, that um, they might have. So the areas that you will hear about tonight include the increase in teacher salary as per the collective bargaining agreement. In addition, we've included an estimated 10% increase in health benefits. We have not um, received our definite percentage increase, um, um, but we have put in 10% as a holding place at this point. The increase in benefits and salary represent a 4.33% increase in the FY20 budget. And if you look um, on our budget website site at the pie chart of district expenditures, you would see that 85% of the school budget is made up of salaries and benefits. The cost of a facilities needs assessment, um, which is $189,060, has not been included in this original request budget for FY20. On February 12th, the school board will discuss and vote on the inclusion of the amount in the budget. To date, the original request budget represents the 4.33% increase in salaries and benefits, as well as the new positions and programs presented tonight, and any other additional increases or decreases the administrators have made. In some cases, um, some of the line increases are the result of changing staff members or items into more appropriate line on the FY20 budget. So you may see some increases and decreases or hear about that look a little strange, but um, it's just that we're making sure that staff members are in the right line. Um, so we will move on to hearing from our administrators, and we're going to start with uh, Jason Mandrides, the principal at Pond Cove Elementary School. Jason. All of the budget uh, documents that we're presenting tonight will be available on the website this is tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Is that volume okay? Yes. Okay, so there's so much to celebrate at Pond Cove as we close out on January of 2019. Um, we're experiencing a lot of great success as, as is historical at Pond Cove. Um, we we continue to hire and, and retain amazing staff, and we're really proud of that. We continue to draw amazing families to our school, um, and it's something that we're extremely proud of. So I want to thank you for um, for a few things. I want to thank you for the funding that that uh, you know you provided for the 2018-19 budget, and I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present the proposed 1920 budget tonight. Um, so I will start, I'm gonna start with uh, new program evaluation. So the packet that I gave you, there's a cover sheet which we'll move right past. If you notice, so I wrote actually little page numbers in the bottom right hand corner just in pen. So you'll see some other page numbers on there. Ignore those. Just look in the bottom right. So we'll start. We're actually going to start on page four. And it's a new program um, evaluation for Pond Cove content leaders. Everybody there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
Um, you may remember uh, me coming to you and requesting uh, some changes in the um, stipend, administrative stipend positions at Pond Cove, and we've been really pleased with those changes. Um, so I'd like to first start with the content leaders. So the concept here is that there are four content leaders for Pond Cove. Uh, there, would, there is a math, a literacy ELA, a science, and a social studies. And so that those are staff members who are particularly savvy or well-versed in those areas that um, apply for these positions and then eventually are offered these positions for the stipend and throughout the year uh, they work closely with myself and they work closely with Kathy Stankard as well. Uh, it's, I, I believe and staff have expressed that it's, it, it was a really good move for us to or structure in this way. It's, it's really great um, it's a great connection between myself and the staff as it relates to curriculum development and Kathy and the staff and, Ka and Kathy and myself. It keeps us all on the same page. So uh, I'm strongly recommending that we leave that structure in place for next year. Um, I'll just keep on going. So next is program evaluation page six for grade level team leaders. So this was another piece of the restructuring for the administrative stipend positions. Um, we, had, we had a different structure before with like an organizational team leader, more about logistics, and then another group for um, talking more about students and data. Uh, and so those two are kind of merged in this position, although the content leader positions are still there really fulfilling the curriculum part. So. Um, so this is, I've been extremely impressed with this team. These folks do a lot. They um, facilitate team meetings every week with their grade level team or their department teams. They communicate with me on a very regular basis. I run things by them all the time uh, to see if they might be good ideas or not to present to the whole staff. They are responsible for um, helping to coordinate some of the professional development. If we're targeting professional development to tailoring it to meet the needs of a grade level, they work with their teams to decide um, what that should look like. They also work on the budget. It, it's, a, it's a large list, so they're very busy folks. Um, and I'm strongly recommending we, I'm, I'm proposing that we receive funding to fund these stipends again for next year. So SST leader stipend. So that was another um, piece where we made another adjustment. We had five student support team, that's SST stands for that student support team, five SST members. And so I proposed um, to change that to four members and a leader. And so we currently, um, we have that structure in place in, in our leader, you know, the leader stipend is, is a larger amount than the members because the leader takes on more responsibilities. Um, so this year, the leader um, is, she's in our audience, it's Rosemary, hello. <laughs> so, so Rosemary's our, our leader today, and she's here tonight. So she helps coordinate meetings, works with the team, works closely with, with Sarah Forey Pettit, assistant principal, on developing and maintaining the SST process. Um, at this time, with all our current structures in place, I'm recommending that that stay in place too and, and asking for funding for that as well. So I think we're pretty happy with the changes. So those are the evaluation, um, those are the evaluations. So will, will you folks have any questions for me or are we right now? It's I, one quick question. Yeah. I know tonight it's not meant to be for questions. I just wanted to clarify that the, for the new proposed um, program, for the one you just, the SST leader, are you uh, cutting the um, members from five to four? So, yes, so there were five members. Now there are four members and one leader. It's in place now. It's in place now. It's in place now, four members and one leader. So mm -hmm. there's no change. Right. right. I'm okay. proposing we leave it this way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on page six, how many are you proposing there? 
Let me take a look. Page six. Okay, so grade level team leaders, there are seven of those. So those are one for each grade level, K through four, uh, and then allied arts team, and then special education team. And that's the way it is now. That's the way it is now. And I'd, I'd yeah, just like to reiterate, to, this is a review of new yes. programs or proposals for, that were implemented at the beginning of the year. Right? Yes, yes. And this I is a, just want to say that we do have so many people to go tonight. If, if we can, it would be great if we could hold questions. Okay. Yep. That sounds good. Yes, yeah, so what I just, those three I just went through were um, evaluations. So these have been in place this year and we think they're working pretty well. Okay, so now I'll move to the proposed budget and what I want to do is I'll start with big picture overview. And on that big picture overview, you will see some new proposals highlighted and then after I go through the whole big picture, I'll go back and talk about each highlighted new proposal. Okay, so if you go, now you're gonna go back to page two. I was a little out of order, but it kind of makes sense. We're keeping us on our toes. Right, so if everybody goes to page two. Okay. So I'm going to start going through this. If anything's unclear, you could ask me to, you know, repeat. So we start with um, this is these are projections, projection projected enrollment. So right now we have 111 kindergartners. Um, I'm I put a projection. I think um, I put 110. Of course, we don't know. Last year at this time we had 42 registered. Right now we have 75 registered. That doesn't necessarily mean the grand total will be more, but it shows that I don't think we're going to be low because we're already at 75. We just started taking registration. So I'm projecting a relatively larger group this year. I think if you went, if we went back and looked at the five year projections from the town, it would probably be about 100, but we seem to be climbing. So I would say 100 to 110. Um, so grade K, around 110. Grade 1, 111. Grade 2, 85, that's our small class. And so uh, keep in mind, so 85 students, and we have five teachers for that to serve those 85, and we think that works pretty well. Grade 3, 108 students next year, and grade 4, 100. So a smaller grade 4 class. Okay, so I'll just go through this um, relatively quickly. So the proposed budget would be f to serve these students. Um, administrators, one principal, one assistant principal, uh, two, two administrative assistants. Uh, we have um, one guidance, school guidance counselor. So under regular education classroom teachers, you want a packet? Thanks, I, I thought Dell had the, I wasn't sure where they went. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. So I wanna talk about <clears throat> under regular education classroom teachers. When we met, um, I met with um, Donna and, and Donna was true to her word. We went through line by line very carefully and we talked about that fourth grade enrollment and we mentioned this last week to you folks as well. And so there are 100 students, so that led us to, um, for our initial proposal to go from six fourth grade teachers this year to five next year. That's reflected here with a total of 28 classroom teachers, but I just wanted you folks to be aware that uh, since that meeting, I've been meeting with teams of teachers and um, sharing the budget and updating them, and teams in have shared a little bit of concern and they want to talk more about going down from six to five. And there are a few reasons. Um, there, there are feelings from staff that given specific needs in, this, in that grade level, um, it could be challenging to make 
to make optimal class, five classes, and have them be really optimal classes in group, in groups, that it may be more um, beneficial to split them up more into six. So I just want you to know that that's what teachers are sharing and we're having conversations about that. And of course, we're gonna be continuing to watch enrollment too. And so we're gonna keep an eye on that and I just wanted to kind of highlight it in case it comes up again, okay? So 28 classroom teachers in this proposal. Um, five allied arts <laughs> teachers. And again, right now I'm gonna quickly go over my proposed increases and then talk in more detail. So it, this year we have 4.6 allied arts teachers. Our health and wellness teacher is 0.6. I'm proposing to um, bring that position to full time and I'll get right in, into details when we get to the proposal form. So it would be health and wellness up, up 0.4 to a total to 1.0 FTE. We have 1.25 foreign language teachers. That's the same. If you don't see highlighted, then it's the same as this year. Academic supports, we have three uh, literacy interventionist teachers, one math interventionist, and I have a new a proposal, something that I mentioned last year, I proposed a full-time. I'm proposing a .5 learning strategist, and I'll talk all about that, um, the details of that. So other pro professional supports, uh, one nurse, .5 ELL, I'm not sure if, ex if I have exactly the right FTE for currently, but okay. it's close, we'll get there. So .5, it's the, we're sharing a position with the middle school. Um, one technology integrator and .2 gifted and talented shared with the middle school, same as this year. Four RTI educational technician threes, one general support educational technician. And then if we flip it, so I have the, the next proposal, 1.2 recess lunch support ed tech ones. So we've talked about this before. Last year we temporarily had um, two individuals that were supporting this and I'm putting it in as a proposal. Um, the 1.2 would be four people. They're working like a little over two hours a day, like 0.3, so it would be around the lunch time. And I, I'll talk more about that. Um, but 1.2 recess lunch support. So one edu educational technician receptionist, and we'll talk about that proposal and one educational technician, one to support um, a student um, through a 504 plan. So, and I'll talk about that too. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I know there's a lot here, a lot of proposals, but I kind of explain why that is. So then special education staff, of course, not reflected in the total, in the Pond Cove salary and benefit budget, but important to have on here because so you can get a sense of our school and who we have. Four special education teachers, 1.4 social workers, 1.5 speech and language teachers, one occupational therapist, uh, 0.2 physical therapists shared with the middle school, and we currently, um, based on IEPs, have 11 special education technicians working with students according to their IEPs. So total staff this year, 70.65. Total staff proposed, 73.75, knowing that if the fourth grade position comes up and a proposal changes, it would be 74.75, but right now it's the proposal is 73.75, okay? So I wanted to also just go over some highlights for non-salary budget, because there was some shifting around and we're not really looking in detail on that tonight, I can see, but I wanted to talk about it. So online subscriptions, when, when it comes the time, I'm happy to explain this again when we have the papers in front of us, but online subscriptions account went up 3,955. 
That is because we weren't really, we weren't appropriately using the budget lines previously and we had a zero balance on that and we were, we were buying online subscriptions from books and periodicals. So now we're just using it appropriately. So it's going from zero to 3,955. So that's why that's there. Um, professional services account on my budget is down 20,000. We used, that was for responsive classroom training, which has been amazing. Um, so that, that line will be down by 20,000 approximately. Um, regular instruction supplies is up $11,811 currently. So this is due to um, a new science program with increased materials. It's set up and maintaining kits, uh, materials. So it's mostly, not exclusively, but mostly due to increase in science materials, purchasing a tier one, a tier two RTI, so um, intervention kits and literacy and math for our educational technicians to use to support students with interventions. And um, a few new, I wrote physical education supplies, although it's kind of equipment, but what we want to order, each item is not $500, so I'm call, I don't want to confuse everybody, I'm calling it a supply. So David Shields needs some stuff, and so we want to order him some new things. Um, books and periodicals, account number 6400. Uh, 8,700, 6,400, going up 2,461. Um, we're purchasing some level text for grade, for some grade levels who have requested for their book closets and their guided reading, and that kind of reflects, is reflected in there. The next one, the last one here, thank you for bearing with me, regular instruction equipment, I wanted to point this out, and I left the account number off at 7,301, I think it's 8,700, 7,301. Um, that is right now up $10,000 and that is, a, I'm proposing that, that is for um, primarily for music, musical instruments. Um, um, our amazing um, music teacher, Becky Bean, has, is, has some needs with some very old, worn and tattered instruments and I've taken a look at them and so this would, would um, would replace a lot of those. So right now we're kind of proposing a large amount to try to replace all of those and hoping we can do that this year or for next year. So um, just to finish going through this, needs addressed, you know, I think we've maintained appropriate class size um, with this budget, with the exception of still maybe talking about grade four. Um, this proposal maintains and enhances our RTI system to support struggling learners, um, provides ongoing embedded support and professional development for teachers, learning strategist is part of that, improves safety of the front entryway, which we'll talk about that, that has to do with the receptionist, and um, oh, promotes safety for all students as well, and that is tied into basically the front entryway. So needs not addressed that we, um, um, I would just again, I wrote need for six grade four classrooms due to student needs in current grade three is something we may talk about. And then increasing need for additional guidance support is something I didn't decide to address this year, but may come up in the future, in future years. So I'm gonna pause for a minute. How am I doing is this in, ter in terms of time, keep going at this pace? I mean, I have like the proposals to go over. I'd say go. Doing okay? Go on. Okay. I'm not sure what you were envisioning, if I'm taking too long or if this is good for you. Okay. So if we go to the proposals, so we would start on page 10, that first proposal. Okay. So 504 support ed tech one. So basically, um, I'm not sure, I'm sure some of you are familiar or met most of you with 504. So 504 is, it's not an IEP, but it's a legally binding document and um, the requirement is that a student has a disability and then does that disability require accommodations? And so a 504 team um, determined that um, adult support is needed um, in order to um, 
address the needs in the 504 plan. And so in that case, we would propose hiring that adult. Okay? So I don't know if I need to get into that any further. I mean, we... So next proposal, page 11. So the receptionist. So this is an initial proposal to address um, some of the safety concerns at Pond Cove. So in attending the, faci bless you, the facilities um, needs assessment uh, meetings, the, it, that can was I, an amazing I experience. I lost I think. you. Where are we? Page I was still on the 504. Where did we're, you go? We're on page that? 11. Okay, I'm sorry. thank you. Sorry. I'm sorry, no. So the receptionist ed tech won. So there has been and is, I think, a lot of concern, community concern, staff concern about safety at Pond Cove. So right now the proposal is to um, look at reconfiguring the front entryway at Pond Cove and having a receptionist, someone to greet, pe buzz people in to a secure area before they're able to enter the building and get to student areas where students are learning in every day. So that would include working with facilities to kind of reconfigure and create a spot, but the proposal here is for the funding for the ed an ed tech one to greet and find and check IDs and have signed people in and things like that. Um, so we can maybe talk more about that. I mean, we looked at several options and this is the proposal we're coming with tonight. Okay, the cafeteria support aids, page 12. So that proposal, this goes back to discussions from previous years and years before that, I believe. Um, so this would be for four part-time, so they would be ed tech ones, and they would work approximately two and three quarters hours a day. They would be in this model. I wrote, there, I, in one section I wrote recess lunch. Really, they're cafeteria support aides because there's an advantage to having a crew consistent in the cafeteria that we can train and work with and continue to grow and develop common, clear expectations. We would still, as staff, we would still have duties in the cafeteria, um, but they would be the constants. And they would be um, the people that we would really take some time to train about procedures. So it's about consistent expectations. Um, it's about um, increasing uh, planning time for instructional staff. Um, you know, and this would benefit every student at Pond Cove. It's also about, so it's about planning time for instructional staff and having our RTI ed techs who really, I mean, they're RTI ed techs and we are losing them two and a half or more hours a day to duties and we, we could really utilize them a lot better and, and see more students or work with, more, work with students more frequently. So that would be in a way, this would be a, another way to improve and enhance RTI. Um, our RTI techs, with the charges they're given, are spread really thin right now. It's, um, it's not a model you'd often see, someone that's really an ed tech three that's doing some planning and direct instruction doing two and a half hours of duties. So we wanna try to improve on that. So that's where that proposal comes from. Um, so it's about more intervention for more students, more frequent intervention, more planning time for teachers and consistency in the cafeteria. So unless you want me to stop, I'm gonna to go to page 14, okay? So this, I think, I, did I lose you? I got you. Okay, so the next proposal is, I think, really a good return on on this investment, we have an amazing health and wellness program, and we would love to extend that to our students K-4. Right now it's two through four. Current health and wellness um, teacher is 0.6 FTE. I'm proposing to make her full-time so she can serve K and one. Um, we, we have 
down the road, when, if, if and when it's time, we have a great presentation. We'd love to show you about the health and wellness through movement curriculum for KN1. Um, there are a lot of benefits to students that we can share with you when the time is appropriate. Uh, so it would be direct instruction and, and these experiences for our K and one students um, would be something that we really are, are shooting for. Um, it would also provide more equity in um, allied arts for K and one. Right now they have a last K doesn't have world language or health. Grade one does not have health. So there'd be more allied arts op opportunities for our K and one students. Um, we're kind of filling the gaps with to give kids allied arts blocks. We have our tech integrator providing allied arts for kindergarten, and he's really he, then if he's doing that, he's not integrating and impacting the larger population. So this could get him possibly take him out of the allied arts rotation, freeing him up to be building capacity in teachers. So there are a lot of layers to this why I think it's a good it's a good move so and this is the last one page 16 so page 16 is the point five learning strategist so proposed last year as a full-time but we just didn't take it far because we had other priorities last year and that may be the case this year but we I want to really present to you just what I what we, I really think Pond Cove needs as we build really effective, efficient, and build on, you know, effective, efficient programs. So the learning strategist um, has a few elements. So I believe a point, we could start with a point five person. I think that that would be, would be good for us at Pond Cove right now, actually. Um, there's an element of coordinating, providing professional development. So helping to coordinate professional development and actually providing. We would be looking for someone that has uh, potentially a coaching, instructional coaching background, someone that has a lot of experience in, with teaching students and teaching teachers. So there would be that and there would be coaching cycles built in to benefit all teachers and students. Um, this person could would work closely with me, coordinating data, RTI data, um, coordinating and ske scheduling, coordinating assessments. Um, here is a place where it could affect another area. Um, over here where it says coordinate SST process. And I've talked with our SST team leader about this. If we had the learning strategist, that person would probably be the SST team leader and we would probably not offer that leader stipend anymore. It would be kind of a natural fit. Um, so, and then um, that person could directly support an in, um, instruction and differentiation in the classroom. So a lot, very large impact if done correctly and well, if utilized correctly. Okay, I've just said a lot. So I don't know if you have questions. I'm gonna just kind of pause for a minute. Uh, I think for tonight we were going to try to hear from everybody and just try to get that global view Good. of the entire district and how everybody fits together and um, have people shoot questions to Susanna or myself so that we could get them to you and you would have time to That's great. Give, do a little research and get back to us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, you. Thank okay. you very much. Um, next we have Troy Eastman, principal at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Thank you. All right, so Jason made me nervous because I said, oh, I haven't put page numbers on mine. Then I realized I only have a front, middle, and last. <laughs> so I think we can figure it out. Um, so basically the front page is kind of the cost center overviews. And I think largely there's salaries um, 
in there that reflect a lot of the growth. So I know you'll get a much more detailed list of the cost centers, but I think that's in looking at it, it that's kind of what it is. I'm gonna go right to the middle page. Um, basically the middle school is, what you're seeing represents basically no changes. Um, no increases in staffing, no decreases. Uh, I think that the, the challenge that I had filling this page out, actually it looks like we're gonna have four more students next year, so it's very steady, um, but is on the back of that middle page, and it gets a little tricky when, to me when you start to really try to figure out your student to teacher ratios, and so I tried to follow Jeff's lead, and. I think, I'm, I think I can still see his taillights, but I'm not sure that I got exactly where he's at. Um, but the way I, I kind of came up with it was, you have to kind of separate out some of your specialists, your interventionists, your guidance, your social workers, like that whole group of people, and really get down to how many sections are offered. And I don't have that on here for you, but when you take that number of sections, which I believe was like 127 or something, and then you figure out how many students are taking those sections, and that's how I came up with that number um, of uh, 20.07 for general ed classes. So that means if you walk into a class to do an observation or something, and it's a, not a specialized class, not a special ed class, not, not um, an intervention class, you're gonna see about 20 students in every room. So I feel like that's a, a, fair, a fair estimate. Uh, it changes slightly for allied arts because you have some larger sections there. PE is always larger. Um, I did not even include band in that because band is huge. Um, so I, didn't, I think that would overinflate the numbers a little bit. So uh, for the allied arts, you can see it goes up about 1.3 students. Uh, and that includes really PE, art, tech, the tech class, not tech integration, um, and health. So it seems like that puts us you know, kind of in a good place. It puts us near the bottom end of the range that the school board has looked for, I think, for class, for the ratio of about 20. And I think it puts us towards the top of the teacher load kind of scale. Um, so if you, you know, five classes a day times 20, you're working with about 100 kids. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I come up with the teacher load. And then um, evaluation of new positions, I'll talk about that in a minute. Needs addressed is continued support for response to intervention programming, which it really has come a long ways in a year. Uh, and, and I can start to see a big difference and I think a lot of it has to do with the people in the positions and, and the beliefs and the connections they've made with staff. Uh, I was talking with Dell, I think the middle school, which I don't know if it's surprising or not, but has the lowest amount of referrals for special education. And I, I really want to put a lot of that towards the tier two kind of interventions that have increased over the last year or so um, in a kind of meeting kids' needs before they go on to that next level. So I think that's important. I also think it's important on the other end, when, when we sell it so often, if you have a celebration of a student being dismissed from special education services, there's always nervousness around, oh, well, they had all the support and they're doing well, but now they're gonna go to nothing. And it's nice to have that tier two support there for them as they're exiting that service as well. Um, and I think it's made it much more palatable and, and I think it's reassuring for people to know that that support's there. It's not either all or nothing. So I, I think that has been a, a huge success. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. Executive functioning instruction, and that's gonna go a little bit with the new program review. And then the peer observ uh, observation opportunities for all staff, which has been just, probably I don't talk about it enough, but the impact of that has been just tremendous on, on teachers and um, a little bit about how they're thankful for what they have sometimes when they come back and a little bit of dreaming they had something else that they saw. So I think it's a perfect mix of all of that stuff. Um, so that has been awesome and it's really at no additional cost. Um, and then to go back, there's a, I'm working with someone right now and we have the bubble group, so to speak, going into eighth grade. As you saw the enrollment numbers, we're gonna be about 148 kids next year in eighth grade. And this year there's currently a three person team on seventh grade. Um, I'm working with a teacher that I know has experience and interest in developing what I would call an experiential learning team. Instead of a three person team, it'll just um, be, a, be its own team. Um, and it's really set up to try and get a lot more engagement going on in our school. Uh, I think that 
middle school is this awesome place where kids are learning and experimenting and doing these things, but really what we should be charged with is turning them on to education or showing them who they are as learners, um, much more than, we're not giving credits, right? So, so we really should be working in that area. This is a way I think that we can start to do that and start to demonstrate how we can be hitting our curriculum um, in different ways. So I'm excited to move forward with that. It's at no additional cost. It's just a matter of how you will choose to use your resources. Um, so, so that's what we're working on with that. And then uh, unaddressed needs, and it's only unaddressed as of now, I believe, we'll be working on a plan to address it before then, but it's still the safety concerns about the, the entryways. Um, you know, and as of today, there's no solution, but I believe we'll be working on one. Uh, and then we have a, we've identified a need to increase our world language position from 0.75 to full time. I don't know that we, I think we are trying hard to keep on our same schedule for next year. Everybody says you never do the same thing twice, well we're going to try. Um, so the need is not as great now, but I know that it's there. Um, and I think we noticed that when we were trying to fill a part time position. It's hard to attract candidates to those positions. Um, and, and we can make a better program if we make that full time, but I don't think now is the time. And then uh, just a couple quick hitters. I, I tried to highlight um, the areas that went up significantly in a budget that you would say, ooh, what's that? And basically um, the supplies is up by $10,000, which really represents getting back to the pre-cut stage of last year. I think it's important to remember that you cut it last year um, or else that becomes the new norm. <laughs> and I think we need to just always be thinking about that. So that's back in the budget. Same with equipment and furniture, um, up by 10,000. And again, that was cut from last year's budget. That always seems deceiving. Furniture sounds like a luxury. It's really probably should just be called equipment because um, before I arrived, it's uh, I think that line was always used $5,000 about is what it takes to redo a whole classroom of desks or tables or science labs and chairs. Um, and in the two years I've been here, that we, just, we have not been able to buy those, uh, which means you can defer it, but at some point you're going to need more than one room and that's going to be a big, big bill. Uh, we still have kids sitting in the unit desk, which is the most uncomfortable thing you could ever do, I think. Um, but so that's why that's one reason why that line has gone back up. Uh, professional services, we had received a grant from the MSPA and I, a little bit at one point in CIF, and it was a $1,200 grant to basically help do a little front loading for the Chuanki trip and have Chuanki come to us and do some more presentations, just so people are a little more aware and prepared for what the experience should be and will be but I don't think it's their job to continuously fund that. It seems like that should be our job. And we saw a tremendous benefit in doing that last year and made the experience much better. Um, so you'll see $1,200 is in there and it's really under professional services for the Chuanki presentation. Um, we also have a student that needs a microphone and it's not an IEP thing. It's just needs a microphone for a hearing device, hearing supports, and the microphone for some reason keeps breaking. Um, and this year we've been paying for it basically not having a place in the budget to pay for it. So now I've put a place in the budget for $1,000 for that. And then kind of much like Jason had said, um, Caitlin came to me and said, how can I ever get some, replace some band equipment? Because we have a lot of instruments that are um, instruments students would never buy, but we need to provide them or else they're never gonna know and know how to use them. Um, and they're very old. And she said they're barely, she's, it takes a lot, you're investing every year in trying to keep them up. Um, so I'm suggesting that we start putting a $5,000 line in there to over the years kind of get that caught back up to where it should be. Um, we, it's, I would call it an elite program and, it's, and it needs some upkeep. So, so that's kind of where I'm at with that page. And moving on to the last page, I really only have one new program um, position evaluation, and that was for the social worker position that we included last year. And um, it's just been one of the best things that we could have ever done. Program description, I mean, I can read this to you, but I know you have it. So the position is, it really promotes student social, emotional, and academic growth. That's really the goal and the mission of it. And. Um, Right now it's happening because she's delivering, I think she's gonna have 120 lessons to kids, so she's taught every kid in the school 
and she's taught them multiple times. So that connection gets made quickly and it's not just a stranger, everybody knows who she is. Um, and I think we're still working on what the best way to do that because some of her struggle is, I feel like I'm working on executive functioning, but I don't want to do it in isolation in my class. I want to be able to be embedded into the classrooms. So as we're building next year's schedule, we're kind of looking at how we can do that maybe a little different. Um, she's also running our version of it. We call it Middle School Academy, but it's really, uh, when I wrote this, there was 20 people in it, and she read it today, she goes, oh no, 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 and now there's 30 people in it. So I had to retype all this to make it to be right. Um, but that's a growing program that students are just starting to figure out about, and the teachers are starting to figure out how to use it, and it's, it's been a great asset for us. Um, another thing that she's been really successful at is providing professional development for the staff and starting to make them think about some things. Um, I don't think you'll mind, Mr. Price asked her to come in and check out how he was reviewing for a test. I just think this is a great example. And he had handed out his sheet and then throughout the class things happened. And afterwards he asked her what she thought of it. And he, she said, well, I think it was great, except you gave them all the answers. <laughs> you know, so that critical eye, and he's like, I did, and he didn't realize it. And now he, he said, I would have never known, realized that if she hadn't been there to say that. You know, everything was great but you help them fill it in instead of making them struggle through filling it in and, and using their resources. So teachers are now starting to reach out to her for those things, which I think will, in the end, make a huge difference to our students. And what else? Uh, and then I think the last part, she is helping with, we're really trying to put a focus on attendance and tardies. And, that's a challenge because excuse versus unexcused and getting people to understand that if you're absent, you're absent. You're never gonna make that day up again. It's an absence. That's a battle because they say, oh, it was excuse. Well, it was excuse, but you missed that day. Um, so really, it's she's working with me to, A, we're identifying the people and the families and the kids, and then she's trying to reach out to some of them to try to make some, um, kind of some student action plans a little bit around that and how can we help and maybe we need to change the schedule around, maybe we need to do something, but that is another service that we were, we was just missing in the past that is making it making our school a better place to be. Um, so I would, without that position, we would go backwards quickly. So I don't think there's anything else. I, my goal was to get us back on schedule, and I think Thank I you, did. Thank you, Troy. So, um, <laughs> you? Thank you. Oh no, Jeff has charts. So All right. next up, <laughs> and, next up is um, Jeff, Jeff Shep, principal at Cape Elizabeth High School, and he has visuals. Do you want help, Jeff? Do you want help? No, I'm going to use Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perry has a fancier cover. <laughs> Covers weren't required. <laughs> Okay, um, so I wanted to start off um, with just a couple, a couple things. Um, in the nature of celebrations, really having nothing to do with the numbers. Um, this, sat, this past Saturday, um, I had one of the, every year is one of the highlights of the year for me because I go down to the Berkeley Jazz Festival. For me, it's not work, it's pure joy because I love jazz, I love music, and I love seeing our kids participate so it's fun to watch them participate um, and at the end of the at the end of the performance during the award ceremony some of you know that Tom Lazat who's our music teacher received the John Laporta um, Jazz Educator of the Year award um, and that is not just a, a, a New England it's not just a Massachusetts it's a nationwide award that represents somebody who is truly made an impact in terms of jazz education, and Tom has certainly done that. So that was really a lot of fun. Um, Alex Hansen, um, who's a junior 
if any, any of you have had the opportunity to ever watch him play keyboard, he is an unbelievable keyboard player and received the Judge's Choice Award, um, meaning that he was singled out as sort of the single outstanding performer within our jazz group. I suspect he also was given a, a, an award for the entire Berkeley Jazz Festival, but I don't know that for certain, but I suspect he was. Our speech and debate team was, was teams were busy competing on the same day. Um, speech took third in the state, and I think debate took fifth. Um, the girls' soccer team won the state championship earlier in the year. The mock trial team was in the state championship and actually came in second place for the first time in about eight years or so, um, which I think will actually be good for the long-term health of the mock trial program statewide um, and may be a good motivator for our students as well. Um, I, I will leave most of this to Jeff Thorak, but I'm continually proud and amazed that 80% of our students participate in athletics and 85 to 90% of our students participate in some extracurricular activity, including athletics. And there is one thing that I realized after the fact um, that I didn't do a program evaluation for because it really is a position that resides in the town budget, but that's our school resource officer, David Galvin, who is doing as well as I know the board hoped that he would do um, when the board chose to support that um, and, and more so. Um, he is interacting with students. He's developing really strong relationships. Um, he absolutely is not a guy who is looking to write tickets or do any. He hasn't done any of that. Um, and he would be sad if he ever did. But he's making a difference in our school in a lot of ways. And, and I certainly appreciate the support of the board and the town council for those positions. Um, I do want to thank uh, the board for the opportunity to present. <coughs> um, and, and the support that the board has historically shown for the schools in Cape Elizabeth. And I'm also a little more mindful than I usually am because it's a little more formal than we normally do it, that I'm also speaking to everybody out there in TV land in Cape Elizabeth. So part of my remarks are, are as much directed at folks who have not been a part of this process before as, as the board members, some of whom have been, this, been through this a few times. So if you find me being repetitive at all, forgive me, but that's really uh, the, the, the context. Um, I, I will say that I, I want to say thanks to the Cape Elizabeth taxpayers who year in and year out, even when they have to dig deeper into their pockets, as we all do almost every year, um, to support the schools that the taxpayers have historically come through. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that the best thing about working in this school system as an educator is the support that um, the people, both parents and non-parent and community members, have shown for the years over the schools. So I want to start where I have started many school board presentations about the budget, because I do think it provides an important context for understanding the decisions that the budget represents every year and that the school board has to wrestle with and does wrestle with every year. Um, I think Cape Elizabeth High School is a small, comprehensive, high-performing public high school. And I think that's what the community wants us to be. We are not a perfect high school, but we are a small, high-performing, comprehensive public high school. That characterization has implications for the budget. Um, and that's why I repeat it every year. Because what it means for us on a regular basis is we want to challenge and support every student in the school as best we can. We want our highest achievers to be able to have the opportunity to be challenged. We want our students who struggle more to have opportunities to get what they need as well. And sometimes that means holding classes that are smaller at both ends than you might find in the case of either a larger school district where where student loads can be spread out and that sort of stuff, or school districts less committed to the idea of, be, of maintaining our status as a high-performing school district. So we will offer classes of 10 students, um, if that's what we need to do, if, because students have maxed out on what we have to offer otherwise. Sometimes our French five and six classes are 10 to 12 kids. This year, they're significantly bigger than that. 
It also means that um, last year, for example, mid-year, and the board is aware of this, um, and we communicated to the board at the time, that with the superintendent's support at the time, we were able last year, mid-year, to create a class of 10 students um, in pre-algebra who we found partway through the year were not yet ready for the challenge of a four-year algebra class. So we were able success successfully to make that transition. But it, that also means that we do have, it's not that we are allergic about having classes of 20 or 25 or 28 students. Our advanced placement biology class this year is 28 students, and it's working well. Um, and we make those decisions too. We have quite a number of classes that are over 20. Um, we have a few classes um, that teachers, teachers have five classes and they average over 20 students, which is well in excess of what the school board guidelines call for. But our average class size, our average class size, all of our students in all of our sections divided by all the total number of sections is 17.2. Um, which is higher than it has been the past several years. And the reason for that is going from last year to this year, our student population went up and our staff went down. Um, and that was a decision that we talked about. It didn't go down a lot, but our student population did go up a lot. Next year, our student population is projected to go down again, um, almost to the, where we were last year. And the following year, it's projected to go back up almost to where we are this year. So there's a bit of a, a seesaw that we're on right now. Um, so I want to put class size in perspective, and I'll be sharing some more details about it, but when I give tours to families who are considering um, Cape Elizabeth versus some other surrounding nearby schools with whom we're frequently compared, um, there are a number of questions that I always get asked. I get asked questions about college acceptances, um, uh, I get asked questions about specific programs, if students have interest in specific programs, whether it's lacrosse or music or jazz or whatever it might be. But the one question that every single family asks, and it's almost the first one out of their mouths, is what's the class size? Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind. Our average class size is 17.2. That is virtually identical to, our, to the, the districts with whom we compare ourselves. Um, our student, student to teacher ratio, which is the basis of the EPS formula, is 13.5. Um, our two companion schools, or comparable schools with whom we're most frequently compared across the bridge, their EPS number student teacher ratio is 13.6. I know that because I've talked to the principals and done the calculations and those sorts of things. Now, one thing I do want to say, and the reason why I'm going into a little more background than I have in the past, is that last year in the budget discussions, for the very first time, I was asked some great questions about the EPS formula. And I welcome those questions because it caused me to learn a lot really quickly about the EPS formula, because I'd never been asked before. I never had to really encounter that question. One of the things that I did discover is that the information on which the state was basing its EPS calculations last year, which led to some wondering about whether or not we are overstaffed at Cape Elizabeth High School compared to our companion schools, the information was inaccurate. It overstated the number of teachers we had by approximately two teachers. Um, and so I'm a little sensitive about that narrative that began to develop last year. Um, and I want, so I'm spending more time in sort of talking about that. So our EPS right now is 13.5. I actually think it's 13.6 because I had forgotten about um, one of our teachers, part of whose teaching assignment is supporting the robotics program, which is a district-wide program, K through 12. So if I factor that in, um, basically by numbers, by test scores and that sort of thing, the three top performing schools in the state of Maine have an EPS of 13.6. We're all exactly the same place. Um, that's lower than what the state calls for. The state calls for 16. That's what it bases its EPS formula on. 
And I know that the board will have no energy behind moving us anywhere near, well, significantly near um, 16. Because if it did, then our class sizes would, by my calculations, end up being a, an average class size would go from 17.2 or around 17 to over 20, uh, which would be well in excess of student boards, school board guidelines around student load per teacher. Um, so, and it would cause families who are considering where to move considerable pause when they think about our class size, average class size, compared to class sizes in schools with whom we are compared on a regular basis. Um, okay, so now I want to jump into the, this document. <coughs> So the first page is programs that were new this year and proposed for, and also for next year. The new funded programs for this year, we didn't have any new funded programs for this year. Um, I, I say this with no bitterness at all because I think I took these off the table very early on, but I had proposed last year a part-time literacy teacher and a part-time computer programming teacher. Both, neither of those got funded through last year's budget. And, um, I do want to mention that although we got no new funding for programs, we, that didn't stop us from adding new programs with the staff that we had. So we are now, and uh, one of the programs that I'm just so proud of at the high school that has made a big difference for a significant and growing number of freshmen who are making the transition to the high school is the Freshman Academy. So this year we have three Freshman Academy classes being taught. Um, which I think is delivering those services to almost a third of our freshmen this year. Um, so one section is taught by Nate Carpenter, our assistant principal, and Ben Raymond, a special education teacher. Um, another section is taught by Sarah Beckel, who's one of our PE teachers, and by Tom Cohan, um, who's one of our academic skills um, teachers. And then there is a third section, which is being taught by Danielle Grimes, who's a social worker in the school. Um, and she's co-teaching that class with Ben Raymond, uh, who's also a special educator. So Ben is teaching two, and then we figured out a way to do, to do a couple of more. We're also teaching an AP computer programming class this year. Um, Ginger Raspilly was teaching that. We had AP computer programming last year, but it was, it was an independent study last year. So this year, it's a, it's a regular program. Um, my proposals for new programs this year, um, I'm back to advocating for a part-time uh, regular education literacy teacher, and I'm back to advocating for a part-time computer programming teacher. Um, so, um, so the next pages are the new program proposals for those positions. Um, the regular education literacy teacher would be a three-fifths teacher or a six-tenths teacher. Essentially, it would be somebody who teaches three classes um, all year. Um, we had a literacy teacher, part-time literacy teacher, several years ago who had been teaching for several years. Um, for a lot of different reasons, she chose to go back into her previous role as a Spanish teacher, and given the budget that we had at that, that the school board faced at that time, um, that position didn't get replaced. Um, but from the experience that we had when that teacher was teaching literacy, I know that, the, the, that it, it will be successful. I was meeting with her the other day and she was talking about the data she collected about the increases in PSAT scores, standardized test scores when that program did exist. And that right now, not that that's the only measure of students' ability to read, but it is a significant measure of a student's ability to read. Um, so we do know that historically, based on standardized test scores, about 10 to 15 percent of our kids end up below benchmarks, and those are the group of kids that we would be targeting. Um, so I'm hopeful that somehow we can get that position back. Um, the computer programming teacher would be, is, it's a, which is the next page, um, proposed as a 0 0.4 FTE computer programming teacher. Essentially that would allow two year-long classes or four semester classes or some combination. It would probably be AP computer program, which is a year-long class, and I think probably two introductory programming classes. 
Right now, uh, for the past few years, Ginger Raspiller, who's our technology integrator, that's what her contract says, she has been teaching, because it's a passion of hers, um, she has been teaching computer programming. But the time that she's spending on that, much as she loves to do it, does significantly take away from her technology integration, which, was, which is her major role. Um, and I think it's time with a growing program to see if we can get that back in a more regularized sort of um, staffing um, system. That's that. Okay, um, then the next page is the printout by, um, by category totals. Um, I will point out, echoing Donna, that at the very, very, very bottom, um, the, down in the lower right-hand corner, um, the single digit number seven, that's the percentage, total percentage increase. Now that's salaries and non-salaries combined, so roughly 60% of that, actually a little over 60% of that represents salary increases and benefits increases. Um, according to our collective bargaining agreements, the balance is for some increases, that I'll, and I'll highlight those for you when I go through the next document in terms of the major areas of increase, okay? All right, the next page is the cost center review. So this year right now we are about 540 students. Next year I project about 511, which is approximately 27 less than we have this year. Uh, the following year I project we're gonna be up between 530 and 40 again. Um, the grade nine number that I've put in there um, is factoring in an assumption that about a half dozen students, as they have forever, will make a decision to go to a private school, a charter school, or something like that. So, I'm, uh, so that is sort of about six less than what the current registration is in eighth grade. So that's what I'm assuming. You've got, then we go through our staffing, um, three administrators, uh, principal assistant, principal athletic administrator. Um, Counseling social work, two school counselors, one college counselor, one regular education social worker, um, academic support. One of the things I do want to point out um, is that right now, all of the sort of academic support people that the high school has, which is basically our um, Achievement Center coordinator and our academic skills support folks, they are all ed techs, they are not teachers. Um, we, at this point, have no teacher level positions for academic support. Um, so I, I think it's just keep those numbers in mind. I, d I have listed here, because um, I'm sort of projecting staffing for next year, depending on what the board does with the budget. So I have listed the one change to that is I have proposed a .6 literacy teacher. So that would be somebody who is a certified teacher. But that would be the first support position that we've had in the high school. That would be a teacher level support position. So then you see our regular education classroom teachers, fairly straightforward, they're um, just in all the different areas. I have noted here that uh, under world languages, um, I've put in a number that assumes that we would be offering Latin next year strictly through an online modality. Um, if, we, if the board wished to discuss that and, and, and um, take a different position on it, our current Latin teacher who is retiring this year is essentially 0.5. Um, he's 0.4, which means he teach, teaches two classes, and then he teaches some morning things that en end up being about the equivalent of 0.5. So he's essentially a 0.5 teacher right now. Um, the rest of them are exactly the same. Other professional support positions, we have a nurse, we have a librarian, we have a technology integrator, administrative assistants, um, we do have two, we, we, do, we have four, so we have Joanne Moriarty, who's a receptionist and attendance person in the main office. We have Susan Ray, who's the athletic assistant. Um, we have um, Noni Adams, who's in the guidance office, who handles scheduling, testing, and she's also the receptionist for the office. And then we have uh, Marie Cross, who is the registrar and also the bookkeeper. Um, and I will just point out that, that hundreds of thousands of dollars 
flow through um, Marie's hands every single year in, in our student activities accounts. That's a big part of what she does. And it, that is something that I think can be lost sight of. Um, special education staff, we have 13. I'm, I think we're projecting the same number for next year, but Del will correct me if I'm wrong. So we have four classroom teachers, one speech and language teacher, one social worker, seven educational technicians. So total staff this year is 69.65. Um, total staff that I'm projecting next year is 70.15, and you can see in parentheses that the difference is essentially adding a 0 0.6 literacy teacher, removing 0 0.5 Latin, adding a 0 0.4 math computer programming, it all adds up to essentially a half teacher increase compared to what we currently have. Okay, um, then I get into uh, repeat a little bit more information about class size. You see the 17.2. Um, next year I project it's going to be in the 16.4 to 16.5 range, which is roughly what it, which is actually typical of what it normally is. Uh, for years I've been telling parents that the average class size at Cape Elizabeth is 16.7. It floats a tenth of a point above or a tenth of a point below. Um, this year it's, at, it's, it's a little bit higher than it typically is. Um, so I was al also got there the um, funding formula numbers that I've talked to you about, the student-teacher ratio. Um, I've explained the evaluation of new positions. Needs addressed in this budget, depending on what happens to it, is a 0.4 FTE computer programming teacher. And then I made a mistake. I carried the 0 0.6 in one place here, and it's supposed to be a 0 0.6 regular education literacy teacher. It's right on the front page of this document and wrong on this page. So it's 0 0.6. The unaddressed needs are strictly physical building needs. I'm not going to address those. In terms of the non-salary budget, so regular instruction, non-salary lines are up $25,345. Virtually all of that is accounted for by proposals to replace certain textbooks. Because textbooks are, and I've listed what those textbook lines are. Is there some flexibility on that, depending on what the budget is? Yes, but Donna asked us to put together what, we, what, what, what the needs are. These are all books that are outdated, either physically and age-wise, and or they're outdated in terms of content, and that's particularly the case in, in biology and environmental science. Um, so that's that. There are also some, there is some, uh, more money than I've typically put in to address, to, be, to help to address some of the theater needs outside of the facilities needs, which Perry is, is going to be addressing in his budget. So the co-curricular co proposal is up $17,162. The bulk of that represents two things. One is, and I will say this publicly, and I have told my science teachers last year, in the process of doing the spreadsheet, my detailed spreadsheet for the budget, um, which is really complex, but it works for me really well, I deleted a column that I didn't need at the top, but I forgot that it was the science team at the bottom of my budget. So I ended up deleting all the funding for the science team. Um, and that's about $5,000. So I'm putting that back in for this year as a proposal because we do have a science team and I would like to fund it. We've managed to squeak through, and I appreciate the, the effort of the coach and the science teachers, um, but I want to put that back. The other thing that is in here as well, there's a big chunk. We've shifted some money, which has typically always been in the regular instruction account to support the jazz program to pay for some instrumental coaching and that sort of thing from the regular instruction to the co-curricular line, and that's the other big chunk of the increase. There's a little bit here and there in terms of travel and those sorts of things, but those, are the, those account for about 80 to 90 percent of the total changes. And then all other accounts, the Achievement Center, Guidance Library, Office of the Principal, and Health Services are up a combined total non-salary non lines. I'm talking about non-salary lines of $3,686. Um, the biggest one is for software that's been put, um, that used to be accounted for, I think, in district lines, and it's now being put into, into the individual school lines. So that's the biggest chunk of that. 
Now, if the board would bear with me for my charts for just a minute. And there's a reason for doing this, and again, it gets back to the narrative from the past. But the other theme that I, I, I want to stress is I think sometimes when we do the numbers things and people don't live in the buildings, and this again is not so much about school board, but it's as much directed to people who either now or later may be watching this on TV, is a lot of times we fall into a trap of making apples to green beans comparisons um, when we look at numbers because the numbers can, there's subtle but really important differences between numbers, so it's really important to ask what specifically is being measured. Um, so I wanted to do that. There's a nice big clip over there too, so that will help. Well, I'm just going to do. I think it, we just hold this right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things that is easy to confuse is average class size versus student-teacher ratio. Okay, and I think I think it's important to, to know that there's a difference. Average class size, you divide the total number of students in all the classes you have, English, science, um, all those sorts of things, and you just divide it by the total number of students. They sections. can't hear you at home. Okay, we'll do it this way. Can be better also the people who they see on the camera? Yeah, you could come up here and we could turn around so that people at the camera. Ah, okay. All right. Does that work? Here we go. Yeah. Good okay. to see so, so again, I apologize. So Wind every has to smile, though. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now it's better. It's hard for me. Bye. <laughs> Average class size is total number of students in all classes divided by the total number of classes, and that's how you cal calculate average class size. It has nothing to do with the number of teachers in a school. It's affected by the number of teachers in school, but the number of teachers is nowhere, it's not in the numerator, it's not in the denominator, it doesn't exist. Um, so our average class size is 17.2. Now there's another number that's important under the school board policy, which is student load per teacher, because your school board policy says two things about class size and what's called your class size policy. And on the one hand, as it pertains to the high school and the middle school, it calls for an average class size of 20 to 24. But at the very bottom, there's another very important phrase that was deliberately, purposely debated, chewed on every time we've gone through the class size policy, because the policy also says that the average student load per teacher should be in the range of 75 to 90 students. So to get to student load per teacher, you take that class size of 17.2. The typical teacher, for example, Wynn Phillips in the high school, teaches five classes. So you multiply the 17.2 times five and you come up with 86. So that's our student load per teacher, which is above the middle range of what the school board class size policy calls for. So that's a distinction that's important to understand. Um, then, student-teacher ratio um, is just the total number of students in the school. Has nothing to do with how many classes each student is taking, how many sections each teacher is teaching. It's a completely different number, but it can be easily confused, and you just divide it by the total number of teachers. That's what student-teacher ratio is. Now, Maine use it, calculates a, and I think I've got this right, I'm still do not pretend to be anywhere near an EPS expert. But I'm pretty sure that what Maine does, in its EPS formula, it calculates a student to regular education teacher ratio. So that's essentially what it's using. So Wynn, if I can ask you to gracefully, there's only one more page. Gracefully. <laughs> A little loud. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, <laughs> next page. <laughs> Thanks, you threw me under the bus. <laughs> okay. So, student teacher ratio, and this I mentioned to the board, the student teacher ratio is about 13.5 in Cape Elizabeth. I actually think it's 13.6 because I forgot that robotics thing. Our comparison schools, 13.6, exactly the same thing, um, using the correct counts in terms of the number of teachers we have as opposed to the counts that were reflected in the EPS printouts last year. 
Um, the state's EPS ratio is 16. So I've just briefly, if we went to the EPS number, 16, or anywhere in that direction, but if we went to 16, say, if that was a goal, let's get to 16, I would be cutting six teachers, for six to seven teachers in the high school. Um, that would have huge impacts. It would increase our class size to 20 to 21. It would just about kill our ability to offer any small classes to support kids at the upper end and the lower end, or if we chose still to try to be a comprehensive high school in that way, and we kept the small classes at both ends to address those individualized needs, then what it would do, it, was, it would increase the class size in the middle range of classes well above 20 to 21 students. We'd be up in the 24 to 28 range in order to get to that 20 to 21 average and still try to be comprehensive. Um, the student load for teachers per teacher would be 100 to 105, which is 10 to 15 students over the maximum number in the school board class size policy guideline. Um, and we would, as Cape Elizabeth School System, would be, lose a huge factor that attracts families to consider moving into Cape Elizabeth, um, which is class size. I hope that's helpful. I'm sorry that's a little bit longer than normal. Thank and, you, Jeff. I, I hope Thank it's you. informative. Thank you, Wynn. And Wynn. <laughs> oh, our next administrator is Del Peavy, Director of Special Services. do my best to get us back on track. Um, I, um, as you see, uh, my packet's a bit smaller than some of the others that have been handed to you. I uh, first want to start off by thanking both the board and the community in the sense that I've only been at Cape for a short period of time, but it's very clear given the quality of the staff that works in special education, that it has been a priority to both the board and the community, and it shows. What I'm hoping to do with my proposal is I'm looking to preserve what we have in place. I'm not adding anything additional to it. Um, we have, I did go through the same process that everyone else did in that Donna and I went and Catherine went line by line through the budget. Um, we did find a few errors and if you, I probably would like to start on the first page and I just want to explain some of the reasons that you're seeing high percentage increases or decreases uh, because those will most likely be the questions that will be sent. Um, so if you look at that first page, you'll see that the percentages are on the far right. And given that um, this budget is, or the budget for special education is limited in scope to most like, mostly just benefits and salary increases, as well as the health insurance that's, that's hitting all of the, the budget pieces. But um, the first one, um, uh, starting at the top, you see there was a 19% increase. And this really has to do with staff changes in the sense that we had some folks that were replaced by other folks that were at a higher level on the salary scale. And that's why that, that piece is there. That's why that 19% increase. And if you scroll down, the, probably the, 30, the negative 33 would stand out <coughs> to you as well. And that has to do with this year's budget had included a social work uh, salary scale, a salary that was actually a regular ed social worker. And so that was removed and that's why you're seeing that negative 33 there. The 49% increase you see under the psych was an error from last year's budget in that um, it was, um, 
something that was supposed to be in that line was not in that line, and so it's been corrected. Um, and basically the same thing when you look at the speech and language at 38% and the occupational therapy at 46% increase, those were errors in last year's budget as well. And if you, uh, the very bottom there, you'll see a negative 15% and that was because we removed a por or portion of the the, behavior, the BCBA, which is the behavior specialist, um, which had in, was intended to be in both special ed and regular ed, but it was inadvertently just all put in special ed. So again, that was a correction. And on the back, you'll see a negative 17 under occupational therapy at the nine through 12. And the reason for that was a percentage was moved to K through eight, so that it's accurate ref reflects where that person is working. With regard to the staff, uh, well, I do have some, essentially the projection for students that I put on there with the total of 160 is just that, a projection. We do have an idea of incoming CDS students as well as graduating students and the projection is that we're gonna remain steady at the right around the 160. Uh, staff that I have listed, uh, we have a, a one full-time admin assistant. We have a 0.5 ed tech one who is the record keeper. Um, we have 13 special education teachers. We have 24 ed tech threes. Three of the ed tech threes are, uh, their salary and benefits are in local entitlement. Uh, 3.5 speech therapist, 2.0 occupational therapist, a 0.5 physical therapist, 3.5 social workers, um, one full-time social worker is in the local entitlement and that's salary and benefits as well. Um, we have one full-time BCBA behavior specialist um, and 2.0, uh, two full-time psychologist. And total staff is at 51, unchanged from this year. The special education budget is up 7%, which is 232,556. And um, like I had said, so we do have a local entitlement grant. This year's local entitlement grant was $383,000. And essentially all of the professional development for the special education staff, uh, the one full-time social worker that I mentioned, the three ed tech, three salaries and benefits, uh, some of the out of district placement uh, cost, technology needs in the sense of all laptops that are purchased for special education staff, the special education software, audiologist services, and the majority of supplies are in the local entitlement grant. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. At this time, we're going to pause for a few minutes, stretch our legs, and then we'll dive back in. Five we'll minutes. say five minutes.
So the next section of the budget is the uh, superintendent and school board section. And this includes um, some and most of the salaries of the people who work in uh, central office. Um, you will see um, an increase in the school board uh, line, um, and that is due to um, an increase in insurance fees, and there is some uh, funding for uh, the fall school board retreat um, in the budget. Uh, one of the um, proposals that was put in last year, which somehow fell to me, was the nursing administrative assistant. Um, so I will, I have talked to the nurses and I'll talk a little bit about that. And that position was um, <coughs> proposed and um, implemented in order to support the nurses. They uh, do a lot of uh, data, data entry. <coughs> Um, that takes a lot of their time and they try to work that in between meeting with their many students that they meet with um, and the needs that those addressing the needs that those students have so they they did want to continue with um, with this position for next year but they felt that they would like to have a person who was um, an LPN uh, cer certified um, that would help alleviate their load a little and that they could, um, this person could do some intake under their supervision, but they would have some knowledge of nursing and also knowledge of nursing terms. So when they did their data entry, um, uh, they would have a better understanding of what they were entering. Uh, so they would like to um, include the position next year, but they would like to change it a bit and uh, require an LPN. And actually we did a little um, research on this and it uh, would not cost any more, apparently. So. Our next person, our next administrator is Kathy Stankard, our Director of Teaching and Learning. by um, adding my voice to the chorus of thank yous that have already been expressed. We are truly grateful for the support and trust that you and the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth have shown. And um, I, if, if the Lorex speaks for the trees, I speak for the teachers um, because much of what falls into the improvement of instruction uh, cost center concerns uh, curriculum work and professional development and we are just, as I said, very, very grateful for your support. So I want to start with um, the second page which um, is an explanation of what you'll see on the first page. So the improvement of instruction lines, and there's there are four of those, um, one for Pan Cove, one for the middle school, one for the high school, and one for the district. And they include um, funding for summer curriculum work. Um, this past summer, the summer of 2018, that money, which um, has been stable for a number of years, it's $15,000 for each school, um, funded uh, 48 different projects. So these were all collaborative projects so involving at least two, two teachers and they pertain to curriculum in some way. Um, and uh, we had, um, they were just very successful and the teachers, again, were very grateful that um, that they had the time and the support to work on curriculum in a way that they wouldn't be able to during the school year. Um, the funding in those cost centers also provides for professional development and travel during the year. Um, we calculate that amount based on $250, which is um, about the average cost of a workshop or conference, and then um, a, a related money, $100, to cover the, the cost of the travel. The, uh, those cost centers also include um, 
stipends for uh, teachers who serve on our certification committee, our evaluation committee, um, and who serve as either certification mentors or district mentors. Those are all state requirements, and the stipends are negotiated as part of the collective bargaining agreement. And then finally, the um, the lines in, in those cost centers also provide for our universal screeners. So these are assessments that are given. The NWA is given um, in grades one through eight, um, three times a year. And then the PSAT is given to our ninth and 10th graders. And these are used um, both to see uh, how our students are doing and, um, and then to um, inform the support that we provide when they're not where we want them to be. Um, and then we also pay through this cost center for um, a program called IXL, which those of you who are parents in the district are probably very familiar with, um, and it provides skills practice in, in reading and math. So uh, at Pond Cove, we have an increase of 5% in this improvement of instruction line, and that is reflecting the cost of professional development for our two reading recovery teachers. Um, at the middle school, we have a 7% decrease, and that's because we need fewer state-mandated certification mentors than we did for this current year. And at the high school, we have a 1% decrease, and it's for the same reason. Um, District-wide, we have a 16% increase. Um, this is primarily reflecting um, course reimbursement for continuing education. And, um, so in the interest of full disclosure, um, that's actually to support my participating in a PhD program in human development and learning. So it's a benefit I haven't exercised before. And I'm, I, I can't quite believe I'm, I'm applying for a PhD program, but I am, and um, so appreciate that support. And then volunteer services falls underneath um, my purview, and it includes funding for a volunteer coordinator, salary benefits, retirement, professional development, related travel expenses, dues and fees, and program supplies, and there's a 4% increase there, which um, is due to the, uh, the negotiated increase in salary benefits and retirement. <laughs> and then the two other cost centers that I'll be talking about are gifted and talented and English language learners. The gifted and talented cost center pays for one GT coordinator. Um, again, salary benefits, retirement, PD, travel, dues and fees. Um, we also have an online assessment to assist with GT identification. And, um, and then we have um, books and supplies that are dedicated to that program. Our total number of students identified for gifted and talented services is 70. Um, and there is that 6% budget increase due to um, the uh, negotiated agreement. And then finally, our English language learner um, cost center funds uh, a, a single teacher. I'm going to talk about that in a second. There are um, 17 students. Um, that is a 20% increase since, reflects a 20% increase since the beginning of the year and accounts for the one new position proposal that I'm bringing forward um, that's attached to the uh, that's on the next page. So we are proposing increasing um, this ELL teacher position from a 0 0.5 to a 0 0.8. Um, this has already <coughs> happened actually this year um, because of that 20% increase and we anticipate the numbers being the same for next year. Um, we, uh, it's, it's not just the numbers that have increased but the intensity of the support needed has increased and um, in order to maintain the quality of the program and really to meet these, um, the, the needs of all of those students, um, we, we have found it necessary to go from that 0.5 to the 0.8 and want, would hope to continue that for next year. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Uh, next up is Jeff Thorak, our athletic director. All right. 
So I just wanted to begin, I was thinking about, I really enjoyed Jeff's um, creative idea on celebrating um, some of the great things that occurs in Cape Elizabeth. And I was thinking about a student um, that had recently moved into the school, into the district, and um, I'm gonna, I'll keep this really general. Uh, was struggling a little bit, it was new, school had been, school was in, you know, well underway, um, a lot of the athletic teams were well underway, and so I was speaking with one of my colleagues, had heard that they, this person enjoyed a specific sport, so I happened to uh, reach out to them and um, just mentioned if you're interested, you know, I want to give this a shot, and to see the, that eyes just wide open and relief and um, that, that thankful recognition for just reaching out just meant so much to me. It was, it was incredible, but more so I think it speaks highly on, um, well actually, so we brought the student down, met the, met the coach, um, and followed up a couple days later, just went to see how things were going. And to see that student engaging with peers and um, it was fantastic, and I think it speaks volumes for, for our students, for this community, and um, for all the, the faculty and staff that work in it. So, to you, thank you for this opportunity, but um, it's one of the reasons why I love what I do, I love this community, and I'm um, proud to uh, be a part of it. So, thank you for pro providing this opportunity. Um, we're gonna start, so on the, on your handout, on the second page, it's not on the back of the front, but the actual second page, a piece of paper. Um, as athletic director, one of my primary objectives has been to provide quality programs for students to experience um, the multiple benefits of attributed participating on athletic teams. It is in these programs where young people can learn the life lessons that, that complement some of the academic skills that are taught in the classroom. Uh, a key component, I believe, to the overall strength of our athletic program is the diversity uh, in the athletic offerings and the range of competitive levels. So this really provides um, students an opportunity to explore um, and pursue some of their interests. And on the cost center review, I had just put down a few highlights on some of the teams. So in the, at the high school level, we have 48 teams total. Uh, that's, that's varsity, junior varsity, and first teams. Eight, uh, I'm sorry, so there are 14 varsity boys and 14 varsity girls teams. Eight boys junior varsity and eight girls junior varsity teams. Then we have three first team boys and one first team girl. So that's about 412 students participate in athletics out of the 514 that we have enrolled. So that's about 80%. That number has remained steady for, I've been doing this, um, this is my 12th year here at Cape Elizabeth. That number has changed 1% um, in the past 12 years. So it's up either 79 to 80 or possibly even 81. Um, Average per season, we have about 138 boys participating and 113 girls, so that's about 251 students each season. Uh, looking at it by sport, um, as you can see, 41 boys participate in one sport. There are 33% that play two and 26 that participate in three sports on girls. There's Single sport, 36%, dual sport, 37 and three sports, 27%. All this information you'll see on the following page, but um, just kind of wanted to run through those. The, at the middle school, we have 28 teams. So at seventh grade, there are four boys teams and four girls teams. Eighth grade, four boys teams, four girls teams. And then there's also middle school combined, so for sports like um, outdoor track, indoor track, swimming, tennis, we have five boys teams and five girls teams, uh, and expansion teams for basketball, there are one boys team and one girls team. 
So on average, that's about 180 students. In the winter, that number is definitely a little bit higher, um, looking at the amount of, there's sort of that uh, March sports season in, at the middle school, so that's where indoor track and swimming occur. So we have a few more athletic offerings in that, in that period. Um, in the athletic department, we have, there's an athletic administrator, a secretary, uh, a part-time athletic trainer, I should have put that in as part-time, that's a contracted position. Um, and then one middle school athletic liaison. Uh, at the high school, we have 42 coaches that are school funded, 19 coaches that are booster funded, so those would be assistant coaches and first team coaches, 13 volunteers. Uh, at the middle school, um, seventh and eighth grade, we have 28 coaches. Um, and then if you flip that page over, just to go into a little bit of a summary. So uh, in athletics, the middle school, there's an increase of $3,092. The high school, you'll see it's 47269 Now half of that is because we switched the athletic trainer, um, which was 20, 26900 um, That was in the system-wide athletic category. Uh, that's a contracted position, so with keeping, keeping up with the current coding, we put that into um, a line item called professional services, which is uh, in the high school athletic um, section of the budget. So half of that, um, that figure is, is designated for athletic trainer. So the, um, there was no increase in that position, it was just a matter of shifting it. Uh, athletics, so the total department increase was about $28,000, or $28,858. The athletic department salaries and benefits of that 28,000, 14,900, it was um, designated to salary and benefits. So operational is 13,950. That 13,950 13, uh, increases include um, transportation to, uh, for charters. We've been working really hard at and being very creative as much as possible, trying to figure out some ways on how we can um, <coughs> share buses or um, even put events maybe a little bit later so that we could use a bus route driver, but when all else fails, sometimes we do have to charter. Um, there is a new code in that line item as well, so we did designate $2,000 in the middle school and, and $2,000 at the high school level. Um, there has been an, an officials fee increase, uh, which factoring into the high school, middle school, that was about a $950 increase. Um, biggest increase this year uh, would be um, the purchasing of a new uh, utility vehicle, a um, work utility vehicle, which is the um, current one we have right now, is, was acquired from Public Works, lent it to, or gave it to us in 2000, or they purchased it in 2004. We acquired it in about 2009, um, so I think we're about 15, 14 years. It's about 14 years old with five to six years of public use, or public works use. Um, it, it has reached its life expectancy. I mean, we've, we, we maintain it regularly, we, we've had it repaired. There is an issue with the transmission, um, so it requires having someone to push it to disengage the gear. Um, mm -hmm. oh. This is critical. This is a critical piece of equipment for the athletic department. Our athletic trainer uses it to uh, transport uh, her gear. Uh, the AD, the five and seven gallon um, water and ice containers that get delivered to all the different fields. And if you take a season like the spring, that could be five or six um, different games going on at one time. 
multiply that by two, and um, so that it's it's critical for for athletics. Uh, for my sink, my use, it's it's probably it's invaluable. Um, that's what we use daily to set up athletic events, um, setting up traffic cones, <coughs> preseason, postseason, putting away and setting up all the equipment, getting trash cans out on the fields, um, using it to transport tools to get to fields to work on the goals, um, hauling snow off the Hannaford field to open up spots so the sun will help heat and um, help melt the snow so we can get teams down there sooner. Um, put the blower, our weed whacker, mower, believe it or not, those things that we do use around the fields um, that are essential. School events, TEDx, we were out there um, using it to help set up all the signs, the different parking signs. Um, it, it is an incredibly useful um, piece of equipment. So the plan there was it, it, the, it's about an $18,000 investment that we were going to split that with public uh, with um, facilities and maintenance. Facilities and maintenance also uses this for um, emptying trash cans during, on the athletic field several times a week. Uh, maintenance when they're working on one of the scoreboards or working on um, the dugouts. Um, School events, things like Beach to Beacon, and then summer projects. Um, so that was that uh, eighteen thousand was going to be split nine thousand for each each department. Um, so at nine thousand in the athletic portion of the operational budget, that's a sixty five percent. So it's the the increase really is. On the transportation, that four thousand dollars, and then obviously the nine hundred and fifty for officials fees. So some of the strengths I think in the athletics are diversity of athletic offerings, our range of competitive levels, our community support, um, dedicated and experienced coaching staff. We have a tremendous booster group. I mean the list goes on. Some of the challenges um, we've talked a little bit about in our facilities meetings, but um, storage issues, locker rooms. Uh, the athletic trainer space, uh, studio weight room, um, a Hannaford Field building, and then um, also uh, transportation. That's that's going to be um, that, that that that's probably been one of the most time-consuming pieces of trying to figure out how to get our kids where they need to be. And um, fortunately, we have a, a fantastic Pat Fowler, and, tra and transportation does an awesome job. Super creative, and um, but that definitely is one of our top challenges on a, on a regular basis. So, that being said, thank you again. Appreciate that time. It's um, pretty much a status quo year to year here, um, but happy to entertain any questions later on at some point or whatever it may be. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Perry Schwartz, our facility, Director of Facilities and Transportation. He has a big packet. I'd like to start first with saying thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the facilities and transportation budget and tell you a little more about what we do on a daily basis and where we plan to go in the future. Um, I'd also like to thank the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth for their support for our schools, buildings, and grounds. All right. Um, I want to start off, uh, last year it was kind of a hot topic and we did, I did a put in for another custodian within our department and I wanted to say thank you for that as well. Uh, that has paid off 
greatly with uh, the overall morale within the department. We could, we could always use more people, but I'll take what I can get. And, and just this additional person just helps relieve some of the areas that we have problems with within the high school. For our K-8 to budget, the billing budget, uh, we are currently proposed to be up 2%. Uh, I'm just gonna point out some highlights to why these percentages are where they are. Um, most of them are uh, in all three buildings, or actually all four areas is related to salary increases and benefits packages. Um, in the K-8 to building, the middle school and Pond Cove, we have an increase in the electricity, heating oil, and the repairs and maintenance line. Uh, those are the three bigger lines that would stand out when, when looking at the reports. Um, at the high school, ninth through 12th grade, again, we have an increase in salary and benefits, electricity as well, repairs and maintenance, and the repairs and maintenance lines are going up just solely to things going up in cost and, and the amount of work that we need to accomplish here. And we also have a bond that uh, has a, a pretty decent amount left on it that is also involved with the high school. I believe it was for a roofing project. Um, one of them was, and one of them was also for renovation. Okay. So, um, so that bond plays a role as part of the 14% increase on the high school. The K-12 facilities management budget, which is just kind of like a budget for overall, it, it covers everything uh, around the school. Again, we have a little bit of an increase in the repairs and maintenance line. Um, there is an increase in the capital improvements line from last year, which we'll be going over shortly. And an equipment, a piece of equipment, which Jeff Thorick had told you about that will be split, splitting the cost of a John Deere. Um, gator to replace the, the used one that's come to the end of its life. Um, transportation, we have an increase in salaries um, and benefits. Uh, supplies and the equipment line are both up. The transportation is up 6% overall, and it's largely due to this supplies and equipment line. This past year we had uh, three turbochargers go in three of our buses, which was an unforeseen expense and things add up quickly when you start making those type of repairs to the, the diesel engines. So I, I want to prepare for any possibility of that for next year and just put a little bit of extra funding in there to help cover that. We will probably end up showing negatives on those lines this year just because just of the unexpectedness of it. Um, that pretty much covers it. The, the overall budget for the facilities and transportation department together is up 8%. But those few things that I highlighted are basically the reasons why they're up. Um, oh, I, I also did want to note, and, we, and uh, we'll flip over to the next page. Um, I do have in for 19 brand new radios for our school buses. And that is solely due to we have probably about at least four areas that our buses go into that we do not have communication with them. Currently, what happens in that situation if we need to get a hold of a bus driver is they will have to drive to an area where they have cell service and then a phone call is placed. And, and an example would be down at Fort Williams. It's a tough area, it's low compared to the rest of the town and we don't have radio reception there. So if there's any type of, um, instruction that a bus driver may need, maybe a student's going to a different location or, or whatever may happen during a, a bus route, we are unable to contact that person. So they, and they use their personal cell phones. It's that our bus drivers do not have paid cell phone plans by the school or anything. So it's, it's uh, on them to supply that communication. <laughs> so I, I'm looking to purchase digital radios that would help cover us. It would, it would pretty much cover our whole area right out until, right out, out into Portland. Um, 
and give us that needed communication with the buses. Um, the next page is just going off of what Jeff Thorick had said about splitting the cost, half the cost for a John Deere Gator. Um, not something uncommon for a facility of our size to have. Um, we have one now. Uh, we've gotten quite a bit of use out of it. It came to us in a very used condition and it's just now come to the end of its life. All right, a little bit of a staff overview. Uh, we have one facilities director. I don't know who he is. <laughs> um, we have an operations manager in our office who also oversees the entire custodial group and handles our payroll and things to that nature. We have a transportation supervisor and scheduler, one maintenance supervisor, one custodial supervisor, that is something that we did not have last year. That was a position that was made this year um, to help cover our night crew. Uh, three maintenance mechanics, 18 custodians, nine bus drivers, and one van driver for a total of 36 employees. That is the same as what we had last year. And I have a note here underneath um, just, just saying that We've been down a bus driver this entire year. We've had an opening advertised in the newspaper, serving schools, Indeed website. It's still an open position. Um, I, I, I've been telling people that I recently saw on Google News that the condition has gotten so bad with just CDL drivers in general that Walmart has just recently announced that they're going to be starting their truck drivers at $85,000 a year to drive a truck from Walmart. So they're, they're dealing with the same situation we are. And goodbye to win. Goodbye <laughs> <laughs> to what? Win. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm not gonna go through, through the bottom half of this page, but I'm also showing the, the buildings that we maintain are just outside of the schools. Um, I believe there's 18 or 19 total. And uh, I just wanted to, for anybody, we have a new board member who may not be aware that uh, we do handle more than just the three schools with, with the staff that we have. On the next page, the statistics, that's just something I wanted to break out. I try to do that every year and just show roughly what goes through our department and the, and the amount of services we provide within that uh, 36 employee group. Um, I, I think the numbers pretty much speak for themselves and the amount of uh, work that's done by our staff. Um, I, I like to tell people, you know, I, I would not be where I am today without them. They do a great job and uh, we, we do make mistakes. We have hiccups here and there. Um, we had something with the transportation last night that um, we, I should hope we prove, improve on. But um, overall, I, I'd say the staff does a, a really great job. Um, next page, it just needs addressed. The majority of that is just the custodial position and the larger projects that we've done over this past year. Um, it's just a list of uh, capital, there's some capital improvement in here and some projects that happen that are outside of the capital improvements that um, you know maybe a principal may come to me and say, hey, can we do this project? I know it wasn't in the budget, but um, we really have that need for, our, in, for some, this in our school. So I'll just let you read through that. And I don't, I don't need to go through that entire list. And, and same with the needs not addressed. Um, uh, it talks about the transportation department and the struggles and the uh, amount of sand applied outside of our schools. Um, I don't think that's anything new to anybody. Um, and the, the need for an additional maintenance mechanic um, I'm not going to put in for any added maintenance mechanic right now at this time, but it may be something we want to look to as we pursue the idea of adding on to our schools or building that there may be a possibility down the road that we will need that extra person definitely by then. Um, and that's also, there's a note on there for an assistant for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's something we can talk about in the future. 
Uh, we'll go right on to the big numbers, the CIP budget. All right, the, uh, the largest part of this packet is basically just pictures to go with what I'm gonna go through and kind of give you a visual. Uh, I, I try to be as transparent as possible, especially when we're working with such big numbers. Um, and hopefully answer questions, you know, as you see them come. Um, painting the third grade wing and new window shades, that's just an ongoing project of what we like to do in, in Pond Cove in the middle school is to do a class, a class area. Last year we did fourth grade. This year would be the third grade area. And that would be painting the walls and probably some new cove base and some new shades on the windows. Just freshening up the classrooms overall and getting rid of the tack holes and tape tears and things of that nature. Uh, third grade breezeway. Uh, what, what we've been having is this, this is a, a large area where the kids come in from the playground and once you've had about 10 kids come in, the floor is saturated with water and we've had slips and falls and kids go into the nurse. So uh, it got to the point where we have so much walk off, so many walk off carpets in that area. I'm just deciding we'll do similar to what we did at the high school lobby last year and just carpet that entire area to, to avoid the accidents that happened there. Um, continued improvements on the Pond Cove playground. That is $74,000 set aside. That would not complete the playground, but would carry us a, a pretty good distance. Um, I believe there will be more to come in conversations about the playground with a, with a committee that has started a fundraising um, plan and, and, and also working with the town to help a budget for the, the playground as well. So there'll be more to come on, on what funds we have and how far we can take those funds and how far we can go with the project overall. At the middle school, we are looking to add the addition of two administrative offices. And what we're proposing to do is take two little small alcove areas that currently have seating in them that do not get used that often and um, actually put walls across them with doors and turn them into office areas. This would uh, currently our principal and assistant principal share an office together and I, I don't think that's very conducive for the jobs that they have to do. Uh, so Troy has asked if we could pursue changing these two areas into offices. And, and if you look at the, the print at the top of the page, it, it makes total sense and it's fairly simple to do this project. Um, it's just a matter of tearing out the benches, redoing the heating, some electrical work and a wall and a door. And, um, should be fairly easy to do for that project. Painting of the sixth, sixth, yeah, seventh grade wing. Uh, last year we did fifth grade. The year before we did sixth grade, so we're a little bit out of sync at the middle school. But uh, this year would be the seventh grade wing. And again, that would be patching and painting walls, painting, um, or actually applying cove base to the bottom and new shades. Next would be installing uh, installation of new flooring in the administrative offices. This is more of an allowance. I want to see how far we can go with the ten thousand dollars and and start uh, some of the floors in the in the office areas now. Uh, the tile's starting to come up. It's just peeling up from its age over the years. So I'm actually looking at turning those spaces into carpeted areas. It's a lot cheaper to maintain. It actually provides, in my opinion, a better office environment than a tile floor and uh, warms the space up a little bit. And um, I, I just think overall it'd be a, a good improvement to the area. That $10,000 is not based on any square footage. It's basically based on we'll just keep going, you know, as far as we can until that $10,000 has been exhausted. We have $4,500 in the 
middle school nurse has requested an extra sink. Um, there's been times where she runs into a situation where if somebody's using the restroom in her office area and may be in there for a while, that students that come in and need to take a medication at a certain time are unable to use the sink. There's no water source available, so it creates a little bit of a conflict. She's asking that a, a, new, a second sink be installed in her office that's outside of the bathroom. So we have two proposed locations that I'll work with a plumber and actually see which, which works out best for us, um, uh, for her needs and as well as the existing plumbing um, to keep from disturbing any uh, concrete in the floors for drains. Uh, roof repairs, $55,000 for the 1930s building. That is the infamous sixth grade leak. Um, <laughs> I, I want to be the, I, I've been told by one of my employees who's been here nearly 30 years that that leak was here when he was here, when he started here. I want to be the facilities director that puts that to sleep. Uh, <laughs> there's no reason why it should go that long. I mean, it's it's we're, we're at the point now where the, the roof is coming to an age that it, it, it's time to address it and, and do it right and, and finally get this thing off the list. Um, so I have $55,000 put in there to take care of that roof. The next thing is $200,000 uh, for the installation of a generator that would carry enough power to run Pond Cove Elementary and the middle school full power um, all day long. Uh, this, this number is based on a quote back when my predecessor was here. He had, he had received a quote to do this job. That quote came in at about $185,000 to do the work. I bumped that up to 200,000 just given, I think that quote was from 2005 or so. So given the time difference and, and the increases in costs and things, I'm bumping it up to about $200,000. It would be something that would obviously go out to bid and go that route. But I have $200,000 in there to protect or kind of have it be an insurance policy for our schools. Um, and I believe, if I remember right, Noel, this benefits the town as well. Okay. Cape Elizabeth High School. We have an ongoing project at Cape Elizabeth High School of window replacements. It's just upgrading the old windows that the hardware has worn out. Um, you, most of them you cannot get hardware for anymore. We have found the construction of the windows and how they were installed originally. Um, there's areas where water can gather under underneath the frame. Actually, water gets in and does damage to the walls below the windows. As we're doing these windows, it's also, it, it's more than just the window, it's putting them in properly and sealing up the area so we no longer get this water penetration uh, damaging the walls within the classrooms. Uh, the next project would be the high school unit ventilators. That is an ongoing project where when we have unit ventilators that are showing a history of uh, being a problem, numerous repairs in the same room, we start to label them as it's time to remove this piece of equipment and get something new. Um, one of those areas in particular was the IT um, server room on the second floor of the high school. Uh, that has an older unit with an R22 refrigerant, which is pretty much outlawed uh, anymore. And, and if you do get it, you gotta pay uh, R22 refrigerants like gold now. It, it's very, very expensive. Um, so that this is a unit that we want to get out of here and, and go to a more modernized, something that we can count on. Uh, we had about a week in the IT server room um, where it was over 80 degrees until that unit could be repaired. So it's, it's those little things to, to just get us back up to where we should be um, in 2019. The uh, painting various locations within the high school. Again, this is just a a, a number that I'm. I, it's to get as much painting as we can do 
for that amount of money. Uh, I have so many areas throughout the high school. Uh, all you gotta do is walk the halls and, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Most of the areas are in red. <laughs> um, but things like railings, the banisters, the stairways, door casings, uh, the doors themselves, the classrooms, um, all those areas we got painting that needs to be done just to kind of touch everything up and, and tidy up those those little details. Uh, for the most part, the classrooms still look pretty good in the high school, and uh, I would hold off until maybe next year to start tackling uh, classrooms and just get the hallways and, and the door frames and things like that done for now. Uh, new carpeting, patching, and painting in the high school teacher's room. That is $8,500 set aside. Um, if, if you've had a chance to visit the teacher's room, it's kind of just off of the library. Uh, you'll be treated to a nice brown trail that goes of, of wear and dirt. It, it's, I'll say the room's probably about three, maybe four years past when, when it should have been repainted and, and recarpeted. Um, it's out of the three schools, it's probably the teacher's room that's in the worst shape. So um, it's something I wanted to tackle last year, but due to us running out of time and the amount of material that was being stored in that room over the summer, we weren't able to do it. But it's something that I definitely would like to see done this year and, and give the teaching staff at the high school a little bit of a, an area they can be proud of to, to work out of. Uh, the auditorium stage, this is something that, that came up in our facility needs assessment. Um, the curtains on the stage, this is a, um, a number of about $27,000. This was a quoted number that, w that we received. The, um, the, uh, the woman that teaches the program there uh, had put a quote out and, and I think it was just slightly under $27,000. But this is to replace all the curtains and finally get rid of the torn ones. As far as I can tell, those curtains are original to the school. I mean, I, I, I believe they're original to the building. So <laughs> I think we, we've gotten our money's worth out of them. Um, repairs to the stage, there was a, a hole. It's not really a hole, it's an indentation in the stage. Uh, I, I talked to a company that would come in and, and for about $8,500 they will come in, patch the hole that's in the stage, completely sand down the stage. It doesn't look like it was ever sanded. So we've got wood that's full thickness yet. Again, I, I believe the stage is original to the building but I don't think it was ever maintained in any way over the years. So and I, in the one blown up picture, you can see how the graining of the wood is actually starting to pop out. It's that worn. But they can come in, completely sand it down, patch the floor, and repaint it, and, and basically start us off to a um, almost new stage flooring again. Uh, that would be for $8,500. Uh, additional cameras are needed in the first four hallways of the high school. I don't like to publicly say it, but I hardly have any down there. And these are areas where we have uh, the basketball events or, and the auditorium events. Um, it, it's an area that's heavily populated. Um, kids being out in the halls during lunchtime and things like that. We, don't, we just don't have any eyes in that area. Um, and that's just an addition that I'd like to put in so we can, we, we, had, we had a situation over the summer that really brought it to my attention where there, there were some things uh, while the summer camp was going on that went missing from the concession stand. And um, they asked if I could bring up the footage and I had to tell them I don't have any in that area. So <laughs> just brought it up, it brought it to the front burner. So it, it's an area that we need to just address with a couple cameras. The last thing is improvements to the maintenance and custodial areas. Uh, that's $3,500. This, this, these pictures are, are not solely about uh, money to fix the area up. It also has to do with a uh, little bit of housekeeping ourselves in our area. But their, their area where their storage is is not really set up to uh, provide them a good area to keep supplies. And, and what I would do is 
actually tear everything out of this room, put new shelving in, and, and just organize it better for their equipment. The, they currently share this area with the maintenance department. I would like to move the supplies that the maintenance department has up to the second floor storage where we cleaned out the file cabinets and things like that and build them a little area for their supplies there. And then everything's separate and the custodians can keep all their paper products and trash bags and equipment in this larger area. So that, that brings the capital improvements budget to $550,000. Um, we've had a history of, well, I've actually been told we've had a history of a million, um, but in my time here, we had a history of $500,000. Last year, it was cut, I believe, around $130,000. Um, so I'm asking for that money back and go even a little bit past another $50,000 to just knock out some of the jobs that we need to do. Um, everything that I've presented tonight does not include um, what we decide on for security for the middle school and elementary. Um, I do believe it's a very important topic that we need to look at and talk about and weigh out which, you know, which idea works the best. And um, the th three principals and myself and Donna have all been um, sharing ideas. And I think, I think the best thing to do would just be to sit back down again and see if we can come up to a, what we think would be the best option. And then I can pursue a price. And if it, were to, if it would require a new employee or anything like that, we can go that route. But that's all I got. Yeah. Open for questions Thank later. You, Thank, Thank you, Perry. Thank you. And Noel, our director of technology. Thank you very much for <coughs> seeing me and, and also for all your time here. Um, it's very well appreciated through all the 18 members and I know it's appreciated through the community and I know you've heard thank you a number of times but it really is sincere. Um, we understand how much it takes, this <coughs> takes from your family and um, your dedication for the community and the school system is very much appreciated. I only have one piece of paper because in technology we really do not like printers and print and paper. So, and I also have looked up on the on the time, and I believe according to my Google Calendar, I have a lot of time to talk about it. So I will slowly do things because um, I know everybody would like to stay here and listen to me talk. Um, I also have uh, a ratio uh, for uh, to to compete with uh, Jeff Shed, so I'll do that too. <coughs> I'm just going to go over the, the uh, cost center um, uh, for the technology bu budget. The technology budget includes not only the tech <coughs> technology department, but also all three um, buildings. So as you're aware of, or some of you aren't aware of, um, we serve both the town and the school department. So that means we have all the school buildings plus all the safety and uh, li town library, uh, the Fort Williams, uh, the police department, fire department facilities, etc. Um, we also have a student population to serve, about 1,580 students, give or take one or two. And we have about 230 full-time and part-time employees at the school system and about 90 at the town. 
Um, our budget was put together, first of all, um, to, to serve the, the, the students. Uh, we got together with uh, all, build, all the building principals and uh, the tech integrators and some people from the tech department and talked about what the students needed and what the staff needed at each level. We then brought, um, I had a meeting with both Donna and uh, Catherine, and we talked about going line by line, line what the additions and, the, and subtractions for this year's compared to last year's and the following years. Our full-time staff has been, uh, for the last at least eight years, I believe, has been one tech director, two uh, network uh, computer system analysts, um, administrators, I mean, uh, one computer user <coughs> specialist, and one database facilitator. That still will stay the same. Our overall budget increase this year um, is 3.7, 3.8% um, over last year. Again, we're talking about uh, um, increases to um, salary and, and benefits. Um, I get to embarrass people now. Um, I am very blessed uh, with the, those crew that, and the, my, uh, my tech geeks to work with. Um, the town is very blessed. The school is very blessed. Um, these three gentlemen and one young lady um, are really um, top notch. Uh, they seem to understand machines and uh, computers a little bit more than, than humans, but uh, um, they really uh, provide a service for the town and the schools that uh, is much appreciated. Um, just to give you an idea and to uh, talk about ratios, um, if you go on the internet and you look at the industry standards of uh, IT staff, staff and, um, um, to uh, employees or staff. Usually you'll find about 1.1 1 .1, uh, IT staff for 20 members, um, employees. And if I took away all the students and I uh, added the three um, tech integrators to the five staff I have, um, we serve about one to 45 people. So um, as you can see, our workload and the efficiencies that um, happening in the department is, is pretty high, pretty high standard. Um, I would like to try and get other people, but it's been one of those things that, you know, a lot of other um, more important uh, aspects of the budgets have um, played into uh, not hiring those people. Um, as an example of our, also our efficiency is, uh, believe it or not, we joined the, uh, year 2018, this year, uh, we now have electronic PO system. Uh, when we went to talk to our financial uh, software company um, that we currently use, they were offering about uh, a new module for the PO for our system for about $25,000. Uh, we uh, built one by ourselves for about just under $3,000. And so again, not only do we we service uh, the schools and the learning community, but we also look at systems and how to improve systems and how to make them more efficient. Um, to go over uh, the staff, uh, the, the devices that we are currently using, we are uh, one to one from grade three through 12. Um, we're close to one to one <coughs> on, uh, on grade two. This year, um, MLTI, uh, which is the main learning initiative um, group that was founded by Governor King around 2002, has gone through a little bit of changes um, and has gone through a little bit of changes over the last couple of years. They used to um, support uh, the network devices. Um, they also used to uh, give us low um, loans for both high school students and high school staff and, pine and elementary school staff. Um, their main focus when they started out in 2002 was to just give devices to 7th and 8th grade uh, students. And so it seems to me, reading the tea leaves on in my teacup, that they're going to go back to just doing 7th uh, and 8th grade. So with that in mind, uh, we have started in, in, uh, an embarking on network improvement projects. Uh, this year, uh, we rewired 
the, uh, the middle school and brought it up to a, a, a more standard wiring system. We're going to also include um, the high school and both the middle school this summer and, and uh, put new access points in the, in the classrooms. Um, they used to, and they used to um, also uh, support other um, uh, classrooms, um, cl <coughs> excuse me, grade levels, but they're no longer doing that. So what we've done is we have um, laptops that are about six to seven years old for the high school staff members. And so this year's budget, we're going to um, go ahead and replace those. We're going to bring those laptops down even though we're not so keen about using older equipment, but we are going to repurpose them and put them in with uh, the Creative Center at Park Cove. We're also gonna give <coughs> some of those laptops to the um, ed tech um, staff because they are um, use, right now using iPad minis, which are not um, really um, congruent to what they're doing. We're also gonna take some of those um, laptops and repurpose them for ELL. And, uh, and, <clears throat> and we are also going to, um, with this proposal, is buy another set of devices for the incoming freshmen and take the senior or the graduating class and use those devices down to the fifth grade. Again, repurposing everything. Um, and so you can see under the needs assessments that I basically went over all those listings. The other thing that is a major item is we're going to replace the main scooter, a school router at the middle school. Um, it is now nine years old. Things that I didn't uh, address, obviously, is an increase of staff coverage based on the ratio that I've given you. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of other things that we could do uh, with uh, another person. Um, and for example, is we do not really staff um, after school hours. Um, so, but that might be an issue that you bring up with the town council as far as, because we do share that cost. So for example, at four o'clock, you know, everybody goes home, and yet we still have the police department, the fire department, uh, public works in some capacity, and town and the library that continues to go on. Um, and the other thing uh, that was not addressed is a uh, new EMC. Um, about nine years ago, um, we were very blessed to get two EMCs, which are large servers um, that do a lot of backup and a lot of system maintenance. Um, at that time, both of those EMSs were about $15,000 um, for some reason, and I'm not quite sure because usually technology either stays the same or goes down a little bit. Uh, when we were pricing out the new EMC servers now, they're around $45,000 a piece. We have two of them. And so that is not in there. They are getting a little bit old um, and, and uh, used. So. The ability to replace those is not in the cupboard. And that's all I have. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As far as uh, food service goes, um, Peter's not with us tonight. Um, he would love to have a self-sustaining program, but he's just not there yet. Um, so um, we do use local dollars to help support the food service program. We've also included in this year's budget uh, $5,000 for um, new equipment. He has never had a line to buy new, new equipment. So we thought we started, we would start that process of, of uh, including a line to support new equipment. And there's also $2,000 um, for repairs, and he's never had a line for repairs. So that is also in there. So we have really presented all the pieces of the budget. Um, so now I'd like you um, to look at what it looks like all together. And Catherine, do you have those um, pieces? This is by no means a final budget. We know we have a lot of work left to do. We have many meetings ahead of us um, for discussion. But um, this is what we have to date, and actually there have even been some changes since this one was printed. So uh, we, we continue to work on the budget. But this is 
what it looks like all when it's put all together. I imagine that the board is going to take some time to go through these handouts and, you know, or we'll just do it right now in front of you. Um, and I just would like to remind um, everybody that all these documents will be posted online for uh, the public to have access. And um, I would like to thank every person and I would like to thank you by name, Jason Mangerides, Troy Eastman, Jeff Shedd, Del Peavy, Donna Wolfram, Kathy Stanker, Jeff Thorek, Perry Swartz, and Noel Haroff. Um, each of you have really given us a great global view of our school department tonight, and we appreciate you doing this for us, and we know it was a long evening. Um, I would like to thank everybody for committing to this long but important evening to start our school budget review. Um, we really appreciate you being here with us, and um, at this time, if there's anybody in the public that would like to um, come up to the podium and ask any questions or give comments, we'd love to hear from you before we close the evening. Okay. Can I just say um, thanks to our town councilors over here? Yeah. I did want to give a shout out to our town councilors who were here tonight. We thank you very much. And um, I'd like to remind everybody that if you do have questions and comments, please send them via email to myself or Susanna. Um, we'd love if it was at least two or three days before the February 26th budget meeting, which is our next meeting, so that we can parse those out to the appropriate people and they have time to do research and have those answers for us at the next meeting. And um, other than that, I wish you a good night. Thank you. Thank you.